welcome everyone to my live stream. Today we're going to be going over a middle game topic that's pretty interesting. It's one that you can use in pretty much any opening where your opponent has moved their F pawn, but they did manage to cast it safely. So we're just going to wait a little while for people to get into the chat because I'm hoping for people to be able to interact and try to solve some problems. So this Nivergelt Maneuver um, is a relatively recent thing in chess, um, but only relatively. It's not, it's not really a modern idea. It's something that has been used in the past, like it was used once by Paul Morphy. We'll see about that. But it saw more practice from the world champion Bobby Fischer. And it still shows up today here and there. So let's see. Um, the example is named after this Nivergelt guy. The, the maneuver is so obscure and has such a, a funny name that for a while it was like a meme with my friend Samir. <coughs> we would just call everything a Nivergelt maneuver. Anytime we saw a piece going from like a bad square to another bad square, or like several times, or like a, a complicated regrouping move to say, oh, that's a Nivergel maneuver. And that was pretty funny. Um, just a quick note here so this game is Nivergel versus Keras. And he made this interesting decision to back it up, but then take on C6. So this is a pretty uncommon line, but if you're playing the Spanish, you should know how to deal with this. Normally in a position like this, you might see black playing bishop g4, and after h3 they might try to make a stand with the move h5, which is sort of a fishing pole trap. But here, because black has already played the move um, bishop e7, it's preventing the natural follow-up for that plan, which is queen h4. So here black has fewer active options than what they had before. So they have to go for either knight d7, or they could trade on f3 like bishop g4 and take, or they could play bishop d6, and I kind of think bishop d6 is better. But what do I know? Um, I don't necessarily know all the theory here, I just know that this is a thing. So let me pull up the chat. So anyway, the opening is not the really critical part, although it is also interesting. The, the first part that I think is really critical to what we're talking about today is the part where white plays knight c4 and provokes f6. Because this signals the beginning of a Nivergal maneuver even being possible. The maneuver, in, in this game it's executed very slowly, it's not necessarily all done in sequence, but the idea is to move your king over, move your rook over, improve your other pieces, like put your bishop somewhere, put your queen somewhere, and then play g4. And the purpose of this move has a few angles to it. The first purpose, I would say, is to gain more space on the king side. And with that extra space, it could support you to either put a piece on f5, or to lift the rook to g3, which might not be possible through a path that's more complicated like this. So we might not be able to use any other rook lifts, so that could be really good. It's also to serve as a battering ram. You might eventually play g5 with the g4 pawn itself. You'll notice that this maneuver is somewhat unusual, because typically when you start throwing your pawns down to attack someone's king, or create weaknesses, things like that, you'll do it on the opposite side from where you've castled, but this occurs in the same side castling positions. For that reason, I would say it's a double-edged approach. It's hard to decide whether this is a good idea or not, but in order to make steps in that direction, you have to first see that it's possible and see some examples from actual play. 
This game ended in a draw, which is sort of a good metaphorical representation for how one ought to feel about this maneuver. It's not gonna win games for you every single time if you can use it, but it's a useful concept and it works well for both sides. It's a strategic play. So after knight c5, they're just bringing the knight back and then rerouting with rook g1. So you can see he's like slowly building up for it. I think it's important if you execute a maneuver like this to improve your pieces as much as possible before you actually play g4. Because g4 is a weakening move, objectively. Um, one could easily imagine that if this bishop was on b7 and they had a clear view of white's king, that playing g4 would weaken this diagonal and create problems. I think in this particular situation it's not problematic though because they have these pawns that are hard to mobilize. So White's king is relatively safe. That's a good sign that maybe you could get away with a neighbor maneuver. If you're safe, even if you play g4, maybe you could make it happen. So anyway, g3 instead of g4 might be surprising since I just told you guys that the whole point is to play g4 and make all this space and stuff. But again, it's a slow approach. The move g3 is kind of necessary to prevent knight f4 in the short term while white continues to improve their position. They still need to develop this bishop and get this queen somewhere. So they're improving this knight. And this also gives options for the queen, even if they don't end up being used. <coughs> it also deprives their queen of an option. So they played g6 to prevent knight f5. I guess what they didn't want to see is something like, I'm trying to come up with an example. Um, let's pretend, let's pretend that they play b6, which is not completely ridiculous. It, the idea is to play bishop b7, move this bishop, and play c5. It could also support a5. So b6 is not, not really done. Um, They probably don't want to see something like this, where the knight is getting deep into their territory, and they have to worry about whether or not they can actually take this knight on h6 and how they're going to get rid of it. Here it's a little bit tricky. For instance, if white plays something like c3, I'm not sure I'm endorsing this move, but you know, it's, it's a sample. Maybe I would actually consider h4. After c3, if they take this one, this is double check and checkmate. It's a really nice finale. So this knight is kind of invincible on h6, and probably they didn't want to see that. And that's why they played g6 themselves, instead of a move like b6. But of course, it, there are some downsides to playing g6, similar to how our concept of moving all the pieces and playing g4 is double-edged. Pretty much any pawn move near the king has potentially major pros and cons. So this weakens f6 and h6 further. So, But it does prepare f5, and they could go g5 in a timely way later on, so it depends. So right now we're just focusing on the concept. So white is trying to um, prepare to connect the rook somehow, and the reason that they're not going for queen e2 is that there's knight d4, and that's annoying, so we want to get around that somehow. <coughs> so just going straight to f1. Knight g7 is preparing to deploy this light square bishop, which makes a lot of sense. Bishop d2 is just developing the bishop, waiting to see what happens. If he's prophylaxis against bishop takes a2, it's also potentially preparing either bishop b4, which would trade their bishop, or pawn b4. So a3, a3 could, be, could be a useful move as well. They weren't actually threatening um, bishop a2 in the first place, but it's just good to protect it. Why not? It's not like some of Karas' caliber is going to like take on a2 and get their bishop trapped anyway, right? Like. I don't think this would happen. So anyway, we're almost getting to, to that part that's really critical. 
Rook F7 is a pretty typical move in positions like this. This is rook e1. Now that the knight is far away from d4, queen e2 makes some sense. So it's possible that we could criticize the decision to play knight g7. But at the same time, if they don't play knight g7, it's, it's hard to develop this light score bishop. So you can kind of empathize with them here. Maybe the plan with b6 is better. So here's the first moment where we are actually executing the whole maneuver. So we'll see what happens after. Just our first example, we'll just show and tell. No solving yet. So after g4, white finally gets the position that we were talking about earlier where the rook is on a line with some extra space, like they could play rook g3 where they couldn't before. This pawn could become a battering ram to attack on g5 and try to open near their king somehow. And it also could support a piece landing on f5. Here, that would be a tactical blow, since obviously they would be able to take the knight on f5. But since we just were talking about how maybe we could open up this file, that sort of it makes sense, right? At some point, white could play knight f5. If they take, take back, then this open file could be useful. It could be tactically justified. Hello, Vedant. Welcome to the chat. We're just looking at the first example <coughs> um, of this Nevergeld maneuver which is named after this guy, Erwin Nevergel, who was playing white in this game. But he was actually not the first person to do it, as we'll see. Anyway, so there's all this stuff that they can do now, because they've improved all their other pieces, right? Everybody's pretty much looking good here. Um, and now they're finally playing g4 as the pawn break. A lot of the time in the opening we're breaking in the center, like with d4, or e4, or f4, or c4. So it's a little bit rarer to see this, this g4 break. It should be part of your arsenal if you've never um, attempted to break on the flank before. So he went ahead and lifted this rook. And black is sort of backpedaling. This is probably evidence that the b6 and bishop b7 plan was better. But it could also just be that Karaz only temporarily wants his bishop on c8. He just wants to get this knight to a better square somehow, quickly, and then bring the bishop back to d6. So, doubling of the rooks. Now here, I think, is the first moment where we could um, ask the viewers. So now that we know what this maneuver is all about, what do you think white should play here? You can just leave your message in the chat. <clears throat> they want to open the king side somehow, they want to activate their pieces further, but they had to play g4 to do this. So, what kind of move would make sense? Good job. So, well, actually, you chose knight hf5. I think it's a little more precise to play knight ef5. Because if you play knight hf5, well, either way, they shouldn't take it, right? Um, here, if they take, we take. g4 is on tap. And anyway, that if they play king h8, we can play... There's a tactic here. Yeah, enjoy the dunk. So here there's a tactical blow for white. We'll just 
it's queen h5. This is a du just a double attack. Um, well, it's a double attack in the sense that we're, we're probably going to try to pressure h7 some more. And they can't take it because of rook g8. That's another threat. Um, but I think it's more precise to play the other knight. Well, actually, here we kind of want some more pressure on h7, right? So if we come back to this knight, can they take it? Now we actually have, like, more interesting threats. Like, if they just move, um, like, rook e7, we can already win material. If not, just win the game on the spot. So, feel free to think this one over, you guys. What should white play here for a tactical bluff? This one's a double attack. Because this is pinned. They have to go here, and then we can take the rook. And after we after they take back, it's it's still looking pretty um, dismal. I'm not sure if you should take with the rook or the queen. Um, maybe the queen. But whatever the case may be, this move's coming next. Maybe rook so that the rook's not hanging in any lines. But either way, this is a sad position. So knight f5, you really can't punish it by taking the piece. And if a knight can just hang out on f5, that's a pretty dangerous sign. So <clears throat> in this game, they play knight e6. Paris is no fool. And after g5, we can see the battering ram at work. The knight on f5 is blockading, so they can't just push past. Um, they can't take the knight on f5 because the discover attack would be deadly. Like here, you can see that um, they can't block in any meaningful way. Like blocking on g7 just results in them having an unsafe king and giving back the material. Um, and if they move their king, they get checkmated on g8 because of the double rooks. So you can see that that's not really helping. So they play knight f4. And queen f3 maintains the pressure. Like we're threatening, uh, bishop takes f4. And we're also keeping an eye on h5. So here, Karis played the bold move, bishop g7, basically saying, I don't care if you try to take on f4. I'm just going to consolidate my king. Makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see, if, if white goes for material here, now they can take on f5, because after pawn takes, I believe queen takes is just fine. So knight h6 was his choice, and after bishop takes, pawn takes, g5, I think he successfully uh, consolidated, although white does have some pressure still. Like, the sacrifices on g5 remain possible, um, taking twice on f4 is still possible, the f5 square is weak. So th there is a lot going on here, even though black is, is holding on. This maneuver is not, again, not the like, be-all, end-all, I'm not promising any kind of like amazing um, transformation of your game just from knowing the Nivergel maneuver, but it does give you a new position that you can you can play if you just know the basic idea that you're going to improve all of your pieces, play king h1, rook g1, and then play g4, rook g3, rook g1, and g5. It's, it's also easy to implement in blitz, but the, the prerequisite for using this maneuver successfully, or at least improving your chances of success since it's a bit of a, a dodgy sequence, is um, you want to see that black has played f6. Or if you're playing black, you want to see that white has played f3. Anyway, so he went ahead and traded here and snatched that extra pawn. And queen d6 was marked as an error. Um, I forget who wrote some of these notes. So it's a mix of my notes and someone else's notes. Um, yeah, I think 
Cooper wrote notes. And this question mark is Cooper's note. So queen d6 was flagged as an error. So maybe we should think about how we could figure it out. Why is it an error? First thing that comes to my mind, and I haven't like done a very deep analysis on these games. These are some old games that I just had in my notes, and I was like, hey, I should I should show these old games. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind, without having any prior knowledge, because I don't remember what I when I looked at this years ago. Um, I first see the sacrifice on g5, and. I see that if they play king h8, I can play queen takes f7, and then I'm just two punts to the good with a, a pretty major attack. Black has a little counterplay, but it's not much because of the threat of queen g7. So, I'm tempted to calculate this just from this uh, quick perspective. I'm, so, so, I don't see any other options that are as enticing as this, so let's go in for it. So we take rook g5 check, they have to play king f8, because if they play king h8, that's really bad. So now, my queen's under attack twice. I could trade, or I could do something else. I kind of want to just checkmate their king. But there's no place to put the queen that avoids a trade that attacks g8. So maybe something more forcing. I'm not sure that knight g6, even if it was like close to working, I'm not sure it could even work because. After knight g6, they could always play queen takes g6, and rook takes f4 is happening, so. Seems very unlikely. So, not knight g6. seems um, very difficult to move here, so probably it's not rook g5. I wonder why he gave this a question mark completely. <coughs> Maybe it's just because there's a tactic that wins a pawn or something. Because I, I think here I could also just trade queens. So that'd be queen takes, pawn takes, and then f4, which is another theme in this maneuver. <coughs> And after f4, how do we stand? We still have all of our 8 pawns. They are down a pawn. And we're about to win the g-pawn. That's probably a winning advantage. Unless they could drum up some massive counterplay. So let's actually check that out. Yeah, this is what happened in the game. This looks like it's winning for white. So probably Kara's only escaped by a hair against Nevergel, because this position looks really dangerous. So if you assign this move a question mark, it means you need to know that there is a move that doesn't deserve a question mark. Otherwise, you know, they're just playing a lost position. We shouldn't criticize their decision. So <clears throat> if you guys want, especially if you're watching replay, you could pause and see what black really should be doing here to defend if it's not queen d6, which results in losing a second pawn in the game.
Also, it should be said that the reason black is even down a pawn is in order to try to consolidate their king, they sacrificed a pawn on f4 through an exchange of minor pieces. So that's why they're down a pawn to begin with. In order to defend their king, they had to give a pawn. Which is a consequence of this doubling of the rooks with g4 and g5. First of all, what's wrong with king h8? This is something I already mentioned, so I but I mentioned it in a different line, so you can always pause here if you want. But if you play the move king h8, rook takes g5 is winning. Because after pawn takes back, queen takes f7, we're threatening mate on g7. So there's no time to take this knight on h4. In order to guard g7 and attack the queen at the same time to try to win a tempo to um, take this knight, you would have to um, play rook e7. Otherwise, if it was queen d7, we could just trade it. But this allows queen to f6, and this is winning for white because, like, whatever you do here. Rook takes g5 wins the game. So he played queen d6 and got a lost position, but somehow managed to survive. I think probably he was too greedy here in Evergill because he's going for this like quick attack on the king, but the kingside pawns are not as strong as, as they look once he takes on f6. So probably what he should have done is taken here. And if they take back, then he gets the same thing. So probably black is hard pressed to find a good move here already. I think any ambitious move like rook e2 will be punished by this because there's too many pieces on the board for this like going for the rook end game to actually help. But maybe he could just try to like move his king. <coughs> Wait, what this happen? No, this should be lost because after a move like king e8, then one of the rooks is going to make it to g7 and they can promote these pawns. So, yeah, I still don't think rook e2 makes sense. But what if they play king h8? I'm trying to just fortify their king. if I take on c6 here. <coughs> There's actually an interesting thing here. White can't really do this. He can't take again on b7 because bishop b7 will bring that minor piece to life and suddenly black will have something to play for. So, can't really do that. So maybe um, taking on c6 is greedy because it helps to improve their bishop. So maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should just take on g5. Well, now black is almost able to double the rooks on the second rank. I guess we could always trade something. But I also see... See a possibility that maybe we should play like knight f3, not rook g5, because I think after rook g5, rook f2, they're threatening rook e2, which would be pretty bad. Um, yeah, rook g2, rook f4. And now there's nowhere to put this knight. So 
So maybe I maybe it's better to improve this knight with knight f3. I can see why maybe Nebergel didn't want to do this, because maybe after g4, he feels like his rooks are not going anywhere. But there are other good things about this position. I'm sort of wondering at knight d4. With the idea, well first you might want to take on c6, but we already discussed that. I think it's um, not necessarily good. But also to play knight e6 and then play rook takes g4. I don't know, it's pretty complicated. Like. I kind of want to get this rook in before 96 happens, because then I think white's better. Yeah, maybe white is just, just better here. So, anyway. <clears throat> so I think e takes d5 was better. But maybe he didn't want to do it because it would open white squares and create some counter apply. So he wanted to just keep control. And this probably feels pretty controlly because you're threatening uh, rook g7 at some point could be useful but here white has to spend a move to stop anything like e3 and it looks like this is kind of petering out here So this bishop finally found a purpose on g8. Abhi Rook, welcome to the chat. Um, I'm not sure about your question. My, I'm, I'm not playing any FIDE events right now, um, but my online rating is between like 23 and 2500, depending on the time control, if that's what you're asking about. So anyway, we've kind of reached an endgame position where like all signs of the, the Nibirgal maneuver are already gone, so it's independently interesting, but maybe we could speed past this. Just to show how it ended. Still a complex fight. But eventually a drop. Interesting draw. So this was the first, um, this is the game that was named after Nivergel. I don't know who actually named it after him, like maybe he named it after himself. I should probably do some digging and figure that out, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, this was definitely not the first time that this maneuver was used. I think the first time, let me look at my notes here, was probably this game. This is Paulson versus Morphe, and since Morphe's so famous, probably everybody knows this game anyway. But un until you know the name Nivergel Maneuver and how it goes, like from the last example, you might not, you might have seen this game before and not even realized what was happening. You might have just been like, huh, some interesting thing that uh, Paul Morphe did here in this game. It's actually um, a motif that happens over and over again, not just once in a Paul Morphe game. So we're kind of breezing through the opening here, and they're playing some 1800s chess. Morphe has black. And here white has played h3. So I'm curious what you guys in the chat think about um, white's position here. It's pretty different from the last game. 
so it's not like there's a complete resemblance. But let's focus in on the, the pawn structure near White's King. Is it defective or is it good? <clears throat> I don't think you can condemn this pawn structure in general, but the double E pawns are good for controlling the center. And it's nice that they have this open F file, so there's some active possibilities for white. But their pawns being entirely on the light squares means that they could be vulnerable to an attack on, well, normally I would say on the dark squares. And that's probably why he felt comfortable, um, Paulson did, about weakening the dark squares, that there's no dark square bishop. And it's hard for a knight to arrive on like h4 or g3. This one would have to come over here, and it's actually well placed on e5, so that wouldn't make that much sense. However, um, <clears throat> the idea of a sacrifice on h3 makes a lot of sense, especially since there's this very strong knight that can't be dislodged on e5. So, just sacrificing on h3 doesn't work. I feel like that's a pretty easy exercise. If, you, if you're watching the replay and you want to pause and see what happens if you take on h3, you can check that out. I think it's, it's just simple to see that you don't get enough compensation. Like You get two pawns, but the white pieces are right there to stop any kind of shenanigans. Like, I know the bishop on a4 is offside, but they'll probably just go for a trade of queens and use the new open files to activate their own pieces. So the black attack would get driven off if you sack on h3 immediately. <coughs> So what do we do instead? Probably start with the Nevergelt Maneuver. So, since you guys have already seen one example, if you're watching the replay, um, how would you start this maneuver? What would the first move be? Remember, we have to activate all of our pieces, and then we're going to try to support the G-Pawn with a Rook, and then advance the G-Pawn. So the first move should be King H8. Also, keep in mind that the first few moves with the Nivergeld Maneuver are not tremendously committal. Only once you push the G-Pawn, it's like a really big investment. I mean, it's a, it's a time investment to play King H8, so it's not like you should just play King H8 all the time as if it doesn't matter, um, but it often turns out to be more useful than not useful. And it's certainly not something you can never recover from in most positions. So you can you can prepare this maneuver a little bit slowly. So after knight d1, we have the option to play either rook g8 or g5. Does it matter which one we pick? I'm not sure that it does. In the game that Morphe played g5. If he played rook g8, I think this is also perfectly fine. And white doesn't have a lot of counterplay. Namely because this knight is doing a nice job holding everything down. So probably it's not such a big deal to play rook g8 or g5 here. So he just goes in for it. And knight f2 is what white was probably trying to do anyway. <coughs> so here comes rook g8, insisting on g4 coming. Knight d3 to challenge the strong knight, and hoping probably to play rook takes f7. We're lining up this tactic. But he just went ahead and played g4 anyway, because this is really weakening their king. Here comes rook g6, that rook lift that we've seen before. And Paulson went ahead and took on f7. So, what should we play here? Black has sacrificed 
like all their kings safety for the initiative they have a pretty strong position the only piece that's not involved is the rook on a8 what do we do if anyone would like to uh, volunteer a variation in the chat that would be lovely There's probably multiple winning moves. But I like the most forcing option, which I think is bishop b6. And this is what Morphe played. I'm not that impressed with a move like bishop h3, because it gives a move to defend with like rook f2. I still think black is better. But after bishop e6, Paulson played queen takes c7. And here's a little bit of a historical fun fact. So in, in the 1800s, people were still extremely macho about how they play chess. They had a lot of weird etiquette rules. And this included some extra things that you're allowed to do as a chess player in the middle of the game. And one thing that you were allowed to do in the 1800s, at least in the early 1800s, was to declare how many moves to make as a way of um, finishing the game. So you didn't have to like checkmate, you didn't have to like get them, to, get them to resign, you could just announce how many moves it's going to take to checkmate them. And then if you can demonstrate it, your opponent will accept it, and that's, that's it, the game's over. So. In this position, after queen takes d7, um, Morphe announced mate in five. And for that reason, Paulson gave up. I guess he just demonstrated the mate. Um, I guess it depends not very much on their choices here. Let me see. I didn't work this out ahead of time, so let's see. I think rook takes g2, king takes g2. Maybe I should calculate a little bit. Queen h3, king f2, now rook g8 check, king f2, queen h2, makes more sense. So wherever they're going here, doesn't really matter. It's best to play this one first with the idea of if they go here, this is main. If they go here, this will lead to me quickly. If they go here, I wanted to play this move, although it's not strictly necessary. And if they go here, it's all pretty similar. It's a little bit more boring, that's why I didn't show it first. Well, maybe not that boring. I guess it depends on what you like. So anyway, yeah, he announced me in five at that point, so. Paulson accepted that. So I think this is the oldest example of a never don't maneuver. And again, just from the from the top, once more with feeling. So we start with Morphe in this position where he's fighting against active pieces from white, but white is structurally unsound. They've both castled on the same side of the board. But because white doesn't have anything 
um, extremely active to do immediately. Like there are no weaknesses that can be accessed in Black's position. He just went ahead and moved his king and played g5 and supported it with the rook and then went on until morning with g4. So in this in this game it led to a pretty easy win for Morphe. I think the main characteristic of a position in which you can get away with a Nivergeld maneuver is you need to have your pieces fully activated and your opponent needs to have no major counterplay. I actually have two games where Fisher played this Nivergeld maneuver as well, one with white and one with black. I also have one uh, where Yusupov played it against Taimanov, but I might hold that for later. So here's one where uh, Fisher played b3 on move 1, which is sort of a meme. I think I've played the same opening line here, at least until this moment with d3. looks very funny. Anderson has all his pieces out and Fisher's like moving a couple pawns here and there. What are you doing, Fisher? One thing I like about these b3 openings, aside from the fact that they often turn into the English opening, is that you can't, because you've delayed castling, you can often get away with some crazy shenanigans on the king side in terms of your pawn structure. Um, like here you haven't, um, you didn't feed Keto your bishop, so you have some extra options. Now that black has played f6, Fisher castles. And Anderson was probably going for a solid setup. Trying to obtain some kind of like Morozze bind, like move this knight out of the way and play c5. Which would lead to some, some advantage probably for black. But it's a little slow. So rook g1 happened. And it, it's kind of interesting to consider what happens if we just play g4, like sacrifice the pawn. You shouldn't do that in this kind of situation in my opinion, because if you sacrifice the pawn, you're giving black active counterplay, and I think this Nivergeld maneuver only really works well when your opponent doesn't have active possibilities. A little tactical line that I just calculated, just for funsies. Um, if they take this one, you can you can try some shenanigans with this because you're you're doing a discover attack on the bishop, right? But then they take back protecting it, but then you get rid of that one again, and this almost works. The problem with this position is that they can take on e2 instead of on e5, and I think this leads to an advantage for black. Just a quick calculation. So, g4 is interesting, but probably no bueno. So, knight e4 instead. After queen f7, that's like a free invitation to play g4, so he just went ahead and did that. g6 is a dubious move. Or at least, at least it's an interesting move. But this one makes this position very similar to the Nivergel position. Just just for comparison, I'm going to switch to the Nivergel game. Um, the part that's actually interesting. So, maybe we can toggle back and forth if you guys will tolerate me for a second. So here we have like an English pawn structure with g4 and g6 played. And after a couple of moves, here, trying to get the part where you played g4. Here we have, um, you, you could argue about what we should call this pawn structure, but definitely not in English. Um, it's something that's closed in the center for now, and not a lot's happening on the queen side. But white has e4 in and g4, and here they have f6 and g6. If we toggle back, white doesn't have e4 here. They have an open c file. They have a knight on e4 instead of a pawn. They still have g4 played, but black has the same f6 and g6 situation. 
And we saw that um, the Nivergelt maneuver worked pretty effectively, although Nivergelt managed not to win the game, um, when Black had played both f6 and g6. So for that reason, we could probably criticize the decision to play g6. So, um, what do you guys think we should do next? You could always post it in the chat, or if you're watching the replay, um, you could think it over. Maybe write down your answer, just to keep yourself accountable. What do we do? How do we continue with this Nivergo maneuver that we just saw? So, part of why we do the Nivergo maneuver, of course, is to improve the rook. So we play rook g3. This is how we proceed. After bishop g7, rook a g1. I think white's moves flow rather naturally. It's worth noting that white is not playing h4, like in any of these positions. Hello, Shai. Welcome. So, the, the main idea that we're looking at here, just as a refresher, is this Nivergelt maneuver. And just for simplicity's sake, let's take a look again at this Morphe game. I'll just give you a quick rundown. So, here's a position in which um, Morphe has black, Paulson has white, and White has compromised their kingside with some pawn moves. And they don't really have a lot of activity, particularly because this knight on e5 is really good. So this Nivergelt maneuver is a sequence of moves that regroups the pieces into an attacking formation. And the way you do that is by moving your king. And you'll either play g5 or rook g8, whatever order you want. And then at some point you'll lift a rook onto the sixth rank. Here, some more tactical things happen because they took on h3. But um, the main things, let me just show you right here. So the main things are we move the king, we play rook g8. I'll make them different colors, let me see. We bring the rook over and lift it. We often will bring, hold on, we often will bring the other rook onto g8. And the, the pawn that we moved from g7 to g5 will keep going on to g4 and use it to open and attack their king. So this is the main idea. If you have any questions, just let me know. But let's toggle back to this Fisher versus Anderson game. So, so here you can see that this maneuver that I just described has already happened. White played king h1 brought the rook from, in this case, it was on f1 to g1, and then brought it up to g3, brought the rook from a1 to g1, and then played g4, well, so you played g4 before rook g3, of course, but then g4, and you'll see that we're going to probably keep pushing and play g5 at some point, with the idea of um, attacking the weaknesses that were created when black played the moves f6, first, and then later g6, which exacerbates the problem a bit. And we already saw in the example with Morphe that if they play a move like h6, this can also um, create some weaknesses. And again, you can only really use this um, strategy when black is, or when your opponent is not doing anything very active. If they don't have some kind of immediate counter punch, you can, you can get away with this long maneuver. but. Um, often it's the case that they do, especially in like the Sicilian opening or something. But here it's like a much more slow maneuvering thing and black is like bringing their knights to the queen side where it's not clear that they have a purpose there and then putting the bishop back on c8. So white has time to go for this maneuver. So knight h4 happened and it's important that we did not play the move pawn h4. I feel like this is something that people will often get conflated with the Nivergelt maneuver. They'll think like, okay, I'm attacking the king, I should push all the pawns. But this is not the case. We need to at least keep one pawn here to preserve our own king safety. And also, if we play h4, since the pawns are slow moving and don't go backwards, it can be troublesome to activate your pieces through h4. And for a knight on f3, which usually happens before this Nivergelt maneuver takes place, um, you'll want to activate this knight somehow. 
and since our plan is to play g5 and attack near the king, it makes a lot of sense to put it on h4 as opposed to, like, I don't know, maneuvering it to e4, which is often not even possible. So don't cl don't uh, close up this h4 square with a pawn. So knight h4 is a good option. Now here's a, a quick quiz, just a general strategic thing. So black wants to play knight d7 and take this knight. Should we allow it? And if not, what should we play? So feel free to put your answer in the chat. Or if you're watching the replay, pause it and see if you can figure out the answer. How do we deal with their attempt to take our knight on c5? Thanks for the feedback, Shy. Yeah, it looks like Shy wanted to play h4. And I, I know when I was checking some, some variations a long time ago, um, I also examined some lines involving h4, which I'm not showing just because they're not interesting. It's like your, your play just kind of dries up. Yeah, knight e4 is a good option. We just don't want to trade. Often when you don't want to trade, it's because you have more space. And here, I wouldn't say white really has more space except on the king side. So I would say that the reason we're not trading is because it would improve black's peace coordination, which would help them to fight back against our plan of playing g5. We really don't want to let this light square bishop get out, because that's one of the main downsides of g4, that our king is weak on the light squares. If this bishop got to like d5 or something, we would have a, we would have a real problem. We would probably end up having to play with like pawn e4, which would weaken d4, which would mean they have some counterplay, and we don't want to give them any counterplay. So knight e4 it is. Good move. And then knight is just cruising over to f8, where it can protect and serve. So how do we continue here? If you were watching earlier, you might remember there was sort of a tactical moment, and that's like the culmination of this Nivergaunt maneuver. Um, and this one's just like that, so if you remember that part, just try to dig in your memory and see if you, you can uh, apply the pattern recognition to this position. And if you haven't seen it, if you haven't seen this before, because you're just coming in the middle, the so we want to open the king, but here if we play g5, they will probably um, play a move like pawn f5 and lock it all up. So against this kind of um, resilient defense, we usually need to do something a little bit more flashy. So look for tactical kinds of moves something to try to open up the g-file. I'll be back in just one second. Yeah, knight f5 is the move. Nice job. So after knight f5, um, you can just inspect and see that they cannot take it. Here we've sacrificed a piece for a pawn, but we're threatening rook takes g7, which would at least earn back um, with interest, because um, let's say they do something where they, they just want to return the material um, passively on g7. So maybe they will play... Um, I'm looking for a reasonable move. It turns out a lot of the moves are unreasonable, so maybe it's just a move point. Let's say bishop d7, or actually let's say bishop takes f5, because that's the, that's the greedy move. That's probably what someone would play here. Um, after rook takes g7, we have to take this, otherwise we're just down. Um, we have three minor pieces against three minor pieces, queen against two rooks. So it's really just a pure rooks versus queen in balance. And if you're not sure about this one, I think there are a lot of examples in books. Maybe I should just make a video explaining um, how you play queen against two rooks. Um, but anyway, usually when there are abundant weaknesses, the queen against two rooks will win. 
but in an open position where um, someone is able to defend their few weaknesses, um, the two rooks will often beat the queen if they can support a pass pawn and like slowly move that pawn. This is definitely not one of those positions. Black doesn't even have like a shadow of a chance of creating a pass pawn at any point in the rest of their lives. Um, so it's just not happening. Probably here. I'm tempted to play something slow like bishop f3 and like knight c5 and then take on c6. But I could also just build the pressure on c3. Because I don't think giving up this light square bishop is going to benefit black whatsoever. Because then the doubled pawns will do a good job of controlling these squares. Um, it's tempting to do something forcing as well, because they don't have any threats right now. I think there's a wealth of options here. Oh yeah, you should have said knight of 5, that's true. The real reason that there is a knife emoji is so you can describe what it's like to put a minor piece on f5. Yeah, so this incisive move, knight f5, which is also Luis's favorite move, I think, for anyone who remembers Luis when he was streaming with me. Um, yeah, this is a strong move. So Anderson's no slouch, so he played bishop e6 and avoided um, that kind of position where he's playing for one result, which is losing. Um, so he went ahead and created this threat against the b3 pawn. So knight c5 stops that, nips it right in the bud, as they say. And knight e7 is just jumps in to get rid of that knight on f5, and also preparing b6. The knight was hanging on c6, otherwise um, it wouldn't work so swimmingly to play b6. Among other reasons. So, here we have to decide what to do with the knight on f5, so maybe we can leave this as a puzzle too. We can't leave that knife there forever, because if we play something um, lackadaisical, like, like b4, you know, just saying I don't want to lose my b-pawn, then they can just take twice on f5, because there's no longer this pin forcing them to take with the g-pawn. They would win one pawn, and their king would be totally safe, and white would be busted. I would take with knight on uh, f5, to preserve this light score bishop, who has a good chance of attacking this king. It's worth noting here, though, that bishop d5 is not a threat. I mentioned before that we don't want the bishop to um, be activated, which is generally true. But it doesn't mean that we can't allow, like, some things. Like, after bishop d5, we'll just play e4, and they don't have any way to exploit the weakened f4 square, and our attack is still rolling, so... I think bishop d5 is not, not a useful move, so we shouldn't be worried about that. I'd be more worried about knight f5. Maybe we could um, narrow the focus a little bit. So retreating is not an option. Never give up, never surrender. So you could take on g7, or you could take on e7, if you're if you're not retreating. And if you're not trying to like make fetch happen by playing like e4 and like trying to provoke them to take on f5, but with a pawn, there's not going to do it. So if we're going to resolve that and try to just keep up the the power of play. We have to choose which piece we take. So which should it be? So if anyone wants to vote in the chat, which piece would you rather take with the knight? Having a rationale is cool too. Um, but yeah. Shai says that taking the bishop seems more intuitive. And I agree, because if the position opens up, that bishop has a lot of potential. And since we are trying to attack the king on the dark squares right now, and that's a defender of the dark squares, it makes a lot of sense to get rid of it. So it makes sense dynamically and statically that we should get rid of this, this bishop. And that's what happened in the game. The king took back. 
And what's the next part of the Niver Gelt maneuver, just to test your pattern recognition after we've seen a couple examples? Yeah, when when the when the king is lined up with the rooks like this, it's like a firing squad, right? <laughs> like it, it seems kind of ominous that they are aligned like that. So how do we um, open up the space between g5? That's right. Shai's doing well considering he came in like 45 minutes in or something. Yeah, we, in our first example, I think we had g5. So now if they play f5, and the reason I'm immediately launching to f5 is this is sort of the intuitive way of getting like getting out of the, the trouble. You want to close the position. Here there's a tactical problem, and it's that this e-pawn is hanging, and this is devastating. They cannot allow this. So for that reason, they have to go for something that is like managing the fact that the g-file is going to open. So they played the move knight f5. It's also, which is attacking the rook. But it's also worth considering what happens if they play this forcing move, which I, I mentioned earlier. Yeah, we need to use the, the new control of the dark squares, so that's true. But in this position, we also have to manage the knight. I think this is kind of an easy question. Maybe it's easier, to, maybe it's more relevant to ask, like, what happens after you take and they take back with the queen? How do we proceed in this position? Because we've been forced to, to capture on e6. Are we still good? Do we still have good things to do? the intuitive move here. Something that always comes to my mind in positions like this, I hate to say it, is the coffee house just saying, always check, it just might be me. I hate that phrase, but it always comes to my mind when like the right move is a check, and but the reason you're playing it is not because it's check. The move that comes to my mind here is pawn takes f6, and they have to take with something, probably the queen. It, I don't think it matters. Yeah, Shai, you got it. Probably just as I was saying it. Now, how do we follow up, though? Because whatever happened here, there would be either a king or a queen on f6. So this is the critical square. How do we keep attacking? There's a tactical idea here. Yeah, f4. I really like this Niebergelt maneuver, even though it's like sort of a, it's sh it's a bit shaky. Like it, it's hard to support the decision to make this maneuver if you're analyzing with an engine. But in, in practical chess, real chess, even tournament chess, um, this maneuver is often very effective. And I like how you just tuck your king away and you can suddenly use all of your kingside pawns as if um, there was no problem with your king safety, as long as you keep the initiative all along. So f4 is one of those initiative keeping moves that's really good. So after f4, um, we're threatening bishop e5 very strongly, and they don't really have an effective way of mitigating this threat, because if they play knight c6, well, let's see, let's see what happens if they play knight. And c6. What do you guys think we should play here? Any strong moves come to mind here? And again, this is not me like doing any computer analysis. I'm just seeing what can we actually find over the board. F5 is an interesting idea. <clears throat> it looks a little too ambitious. Um, maybe you can explain your idea, because I, I think I'm not, sh I'm not too sure I get it. 
it looks to me like a pawn sacrifice. Like after queen, so they can't take with the G. They have to take with queen takes f5. And here I would probably be redeploying my rooks to the f file. But this seems kind of slow. Like I would play like rook f3. Um, oh wait, queen takes is impossible, actually, because after queen takes, there's queen takes c6, and that's winning for white. Yeah, I missed that. But they also can ignore it. So let's say f5, and they don't take, right? So we're going to try to take, take, and take on g6 as white. But the knight on f8 is doing a good job of holding it together. So maybe I need to use this tempo as black to consolidate the queen side. I wonder if I set my latency pro uh, properly. I'm sorry if I'm uh, reacting in a delayed way. Actually, let me check my latency real quick. I'm just going to transition briefly. One, one second. Yeah, f5 is interesting, but I think it doesn't force the play, and probably probably we should try to win by force here. Um, I thought of a couple things. The, the first thing that came to my mind was bishop f3. I mean, f5 is interesting too, it looks like, because black has to pick some kind of um, developing move. Probably I would choose like king f7 or king h8. No, not, not king h8, but like there's something that gets out of the line of fire a little bit more. Um, but white still seems to have some initiative here. It just might get more difficult to win. But bishop f3, you know, I'm just, I'm going to take that knight and I'm going to play bishop takes e5. So... They would probably have to play like a rook move or something. But this would actually strengthen the move f5, because f5 would come with tempo now. So you could have a stronger version of the same thing, maybe, if we do this. Or we could play... Um, Or you could play e4. I don't know. Maybe not bishop f3. But I also thought, like, what if we just take this? Like, just see what happens, right? They, they have to take back with something. If they take with the rook, they're probably roasted. So let's say they take like this. This is very intuitive, because I see this as an open position with two bishops. I also see a pawn on c7 with my name on it. So right now I'm a pawn up with the bishop pair and the initiative. It feels pretty good. If they block with the rook on... If they block with any rook, I think I'll just take on e5 and trade everything. Probably that's just peachy. If they block with the queen, I'll take on b6. Or I'll just take the queen. I mean, maybe it's just... I mean, it doesn't matter. Let's trade everything up a pawn. I do want to take the b6 pawn, though, kind of. Because I don't think black can afford to get active with their king like this. Oh, I think the only counterplay would be, like... So let's pretend they keep the rooks on the 7th rank to have rook b8 on the menu, right? So they'll play this. Well, no, if they, if they play this, they just lose the knight on e5. Yeah, I don't know. I think White's position's pretty good after we just snag that C pawn. But probably we do have multiple good moves. 
Um, the easy way to figure that out would be to just like look at how many of the top engine lines show a positive score for white. But anyway, that's a little bit of like hair splitting. So B6 was an interesting sideline, but they played Knight F5, attacking the Rook. Um, here, I don't think it's an interesting exercise to see what happens if we take on E6 and then move the Rook. I'd rather keep that tension. So let's just gloss over this one. You have a Dante. I am still streaming. I'm glad you made it back in time. I was, I'm, I'm probably wrapping up pretty soon though. I, I think this is the last example I wanted to do. I have like another example where Fisher does it with black. I have an example where Yusupov does it with black. Um, and those are both good, but probably I'll just keep it to what I've presented today. So anyway, so pawn takes f6 and king h8 was a desperate attempt to not lose the game. Um, if they play queen takes f6, then here it transposes to what we've already analyzed, kind of, after queen takes c7. So king h8 makes sense. But now white is solidly a pawn up. So they go for chop chop. Alright, so now we've done our Nivergelt maneuver. We have the open G file, that's cool. Our rook on F3 is very active. We've destabilized their pieces. Now their king is under the gun. So how do we proceed here? This is sort of out of the scope of the Nivergelt maneuver concept. This is just like a, a nice positional exercise. What, what should we do next? E4 is an interesting option. So, if you play E4, what do you think black will play? And are you happy with it? I think that after E4, I'll, I'll just play it on the board real quick. They can play move knight D4. And... Knight h4 also looks kind of interesting. This was what was intuitive to me, though, because I think part of why white is better is because black's king is unsafe, but now they've stuck this knight in the way. So even though um, this pawn on f6, you could argue that it's safer than before, um, I think it's not going to be safe long term. It's a double pawn, it's deep in black's territory, it's a, it'll probably be a heavy piece endgame if we start trading these minor pieces. Um, I just don't like that very much. It, it gives some counterplay. And knight h4 also might be interesting, um, because if I move my rook off of the f-file, then you can play queen takes f6, right? Is that kosher? I think it's kosher, because we're protecting this knight and we're threatening rook c6, which would activate the pieces. So probably either of those moves is good for black. So maybe not e4. Is knight h4 a trap? Wait, what do you mean? Like, I think black's making a comeback after knight h4, unless I'm missing something. If, if I miss something, let me know. We can come back to it. Um, but anyway, I don't think it should be e4. We should sort of um, play to our strengths. Our strength, I think, is this bishop is doing really well to attack their king. Free pawn on c7, is it? Or do you mean in this line? Here? I don't know, it doesn't look free. This looks like um, black's getting active. Because you're not threatening bishop e5. In fact, you're not threatening anything. You're up a pawn, yeah, but there's also a. No, f2 is not free because of queen takes d8. I guess you could play rook d7 and then queen takes f2. But then you run into um, rook f1. 
I think that's not the right way. So let's just back it up here. There's a lot going on there that's not helping White. We're just analyzing to see like how the counterplay will happen, probably. Here, I think the best move is what was played, which was d4. And the reason I think this is probably the only good move is that the rooks are already well placed. I don't think we could really place these rooks better. At least not in the short term. The bishop on e2, um, I think it would be nice on a square like c4 or d5. And to do that, we would have to play d4, so that's already a sign. But mainly I want this e-pawn out of the way so that my bishop has full scope. So d4 probably is a multi-purpose move where it improves this bishop and this bishop. So that's pretty cool. And they can't play e4 and close the position that easily because if they play e4, bishop c4 looks pretty good. Well, actually, hold on, because then you can take on f3. So maybe it's not as good as I thought. Maybe just throwing rook h3 and then bishop c4 is a, a big threat. Yeah, that seems accurate to me. And you can't take on f6 still because of d5. Yeah, so I think e4 is not working. So they took here. Now here comes bishop c4. If they took on e3, it would only improve white's position. So that's why... It's not that this is forced and Fisher's uh, being fancy and amazing tactical, it's just that like, he would love it for them to take on e3, so he's not punishing the pawn being there, just going ahead with his normal plan. And at this point, I think white is just much better. So he took back that pawn, om nom, and because bishop c4 is still on the menu, they went ahead and sacked on their own terms, which makes sense. And I'll just show you the rest real quick, because I think the end is nigh. As they say. Here there's a funny finish. I, I, th I was debating whether or not it's worth showing. Here it's white to play and win. If you're watching the recording, uh, feel free to pause here and think it over. It's just a nice little... Uh, checkmate sequence. Okay, so check. They have to take. Check again. They have to block and checkmate, because the pawn is controlling and the rook is supporting the bishop. So that's pretty cool. Um, is queen g7 also mate? Let's see, queen g7, queen takes, pawn takes, king g8. Yeah, this should also be mate, so that's a nice answer as well. This one, uh, we can make a donkey or whatever we want, because Actually, this one looks really funny, so I hope this is what, what Shai saw in his full line. I like that there's three rooks on the board. If you came and saw this in the middle of the tournament, you might be like, what is going on here? <laughs> That'd be really funny. I like that. No, you're, I think yours, your variation's also good. Maybe you just didn't see it to the end that there's a discover double check. Um, so yeah, there we go. 98, and Fisher just pushed him off the board. Chop, chop. And he resigned here. Understandably, because this position is depressing. Alright, so I think this is where I'm going to wrap up. This Nevergal maneuver is pretty interesting. Um, you guys can rewind back and see how it's done again. It's just a multi step regrouping um, that usually precipitates after your opponent plays a move with a pawn near their king. It could be like h3 or f3. Usually when you see these kinds of moves, and if they're not playing actively enough, you can move your king over, move your rook over, play g4 or g5, depending on what color you're playing, and even though you've castled on the same side, you can start an attack. So this is a cool idea, and I hope you guys will uh, find it in your own games. So, until next time.
Take care, everybody.